in my book, Darwin's Doubt, I call this whole, this, this uh, problem of the abrupt appearance of the major groups of animals, and, the, uh, and there are many other abrupt appearance events besides just the Cambrian animals, uh, but that's the one I focused on. I call this the, the mystery of the missing fossils, and it's a mystery that has been yet unsolved. Now, that leads really, though, to the most important issue, which is the cause of the change. We've, we've defined evolution as change over time, continuous change over time, but now we want to really think about what, what might be causing that change, because that's the, the essential part of both classical Darwinian theory and the modern neo-Darwinian synthesis or neo-Darwinian theory that we all learn in our, in our textbooks. And according to neo-Darwinism, the cause of change is the mechanism of natural selection acting on random variations in a particular kind of variation that biologists talk about today called a mutation which is a, a, a random change in the sequence of the characters in the DNA message, the DNA, the, the, the genes or the DNA, the information stored in the DNA. And according to neo-Darwinism, this mechanism of natural selection can produce new forms of life, new biological forms, and also it, it, it accounts for the appearance of design that we find in living, in living organisms. And this was really where Darwin started his thinking. All biologists back to Aristotle's time and right up to the future have recognized that biological systems give at least the appearance of design. Richard Dawkins, the famous uh, biologist from uh, Oxford, says that, that um, biology is the study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for purpose. Key word in that, anyone? The appearance, right? Okay, from a Darwinian point of view, things look designed, but they're not really designed. Why? Well, because there's an undirected, unguided mechanism that can produce the appearance of design without being guided or directed in any way. Now, how could that be? Let me give you a quick illustration. You see, I got a sheep on the, on, on the slide there, or a few sheep. Imagine you're a sheep herder in the far north of Scotland, and you want to produce a woollier breed of sheep. What do you do? Well, you pick the wooliest males and the wooliest ewes in every you know, group of offspring, and you allow only them to breed. The other ones get no dates, okay? And if you do that generation after generation after generation, what will you produce? A woolier breed of sheep, right? We've known this back from biblical times, right? This is well known. Now, in the 19th century, biologists were convinced that one of the things that indicated that life had been designed was the ad, what they called adaptation, that, that organisms seemed to have just the right attributes that they needed in which to live in the environment in which they found themselves. So if you're a fish, you live in the water, you've got gills and swim bladder, and you've got all the, 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 you've got all the equipment that you need to survive in the water. So if you have some sheep and they need to live in a woolly climate, um, this selective breeding, as it was called, was a way of getting the sheep to be better adapted to their environment. But Darwin came along and said, wait, I can explain that kind of adaptation through a purely undirected natural process. What if instead of every, in every generation you select the wooliest males and females, what if there's a series of very cold winters such that only the wooliest survive? Then after many generations, won't you have exactly the same effect because you've only had very wooly males and females being allowed to breed because nature has weeded out all the other ones. And he called that not artificial selection, but natural selection. And so since the outcome was the same, since the sheep at the end were more adapted to a cold climate, you could think of nature doing the designing, nature producing the adaptation. So that's how Darwin got rid of the idea of design. And it's... Um, and this is tied up with his notion of the third meaning of evolution, that, it, that natural selection acting on random changes, mutations and variations, is the cause of change. Now, my illustration sounds quite sensible, but a lot of biologists have been asking, well, is that kind of minor modification we see with sheep and you know, the sort of things we see in dog breeding or pigeon breeding or, or the, the kinds of, with the, the finches in the Galapagos Islands, is, is that the only uh, evidence or appearance of design, or might there be other more fundamental ones? And those are the scientists that are wondering, well, does the Darwinian mechanism actually, is it actually creative? And um, Lynn Margulis, whom I quoted a few minutes ago, has said this, she says, natural selection eliminates 
and maybe maintains, but it doesn't create, it doesn't generate anything fundamentally new. Neo-Darwinists say that new species emerge when mutations occur and modify an organism, and I believe that, she said, until I looked for evidence. So this is the real, the real nub of the issue. Is the Darwinian mechanism genuinely creative? Yes, you can get slightly woolier sheep, maybe you can get finch, you get bit, finch beaks that are bigger or smaller, but do you have a mechanism that can build new animals, build the sheep, build the, the, uh, the birds in the first place? And so this, this is, the, this is the, the issue that I want to focus on in the rest of my talk tonight. It's a particularly acute issue actually in the, in the Christian world right now because there are also a lot of theistic evolutionists or evolutionary creationists as they're sometimes called who quote accept that natural selection and other evolutionary mechanisms acting over long periods of time eventually result in major changes in body structure. This is Deborah Harzma of the Biologos Institute, a leading theistic evolution group. And she, said, and she equates this mechanism of natural selection with God's creativity. She says that, that natural selection and the, the gradual process of evolution was crafted and governed by God to create the diversity of all life on earth. So theistic evolutionists equate the creativity of God with the creativity of the evolutionary mechanism of natural selection and random mutation. And that just raises in a new way the question, is that mechanism really creative? And that's what, that's what I want to look at. Now, in this talk, I have four challenges to the creative power of natural selection. Probably won't get through all four. Maybe we'll do three tonight. But I want you to, I want you, I, I address these in a lot of depth in the, in the book, Darwin's Doubt. In, a sec, in, the, in the book, in a sec, section of the book I call, How to Build an Animal. The first, the first mystery is, wh where are the missing fossils? Why the abrupt appearance? But the deeper mystery in the history of life is, what actually causes these big changes that we see in the history of life as recorded in the fossil record? And that's really a, an engineering question is a question of how you would build something as complex as a trilobite or a triceratops or a giraffe or a human being. What, what's, the, what's the real driving mechanism or cause? And there are a number of challenges to the idea that natural selection and random mutation can do that. And that's what I want to talk about now. The first is a, a problem known as the problem of the origin of genetic information. I used to ask my students when I was a press professor, if you want to give your your uh, computer a new function, what do you have to give it? And since there's a lot of students here, why don't I ask you all that? What do you have to give your computer if you want it to perform a new function? Code, right? Code or information, instructions, okay? We know this because we live in an information age. Well, it turns out, and this is the most stunning discovery of 20th century biology, that the same thing is true of life. You want to build a new form of life, if you want to build one of those Cambrian animals that I studied, or if you want to build um, new mammals, new reptiles, new birds, anything, you've got to have new code. You have to have new information. Now, we began to appreciate this in, you have to have instructions to build new biological form. And we began to appreciate this starting in the 1950s with the discovery of the structure of the DNA molecule by Watson and Crick. Most of you studied that in, yeah, right, okay. And um, <clears throat> Watson and Crick discovered that DNA had this beautiful hel double helix structure. And along the interior of the molecule, they also discovered that there were four chemicals called bases or nucleotide bases that attached to that helix backbone. And in 1957, four years after they made the original discovery, Francis Crick posited something he called the sequence hypothesis. And this was the idea that those four chemical subunits called bases were functioning just like alphabetic characters in a written text or like the digital characters, the zeros and ones we use in software today. That is to say, it wasn't the, the shape or the weight or the chemical properties of these subunits in the DNA that gave them their function. Rather, it was their specific arrangement in accord with an independent code, later discovered and called the genetic code, that allowed the arrangements of those characters, or chemical characters, to convey information for building all the most important molecules 